Final Fantasy XIV is my favorite MMORPG. Even with all the issues I've had with it throughout all its years, I've been on a break since the end of Shadowbringers uh, for being burnt out, and really had no urge to come back to the game. But then I saw something with Dawn Trail, its trailer, that caught my eye, that it brought me back. So with that, I have an entire expansion to get through, which was Endwalker. But this video is not about that. So this is what I want to say is I am a casual at FF14. I do enjoy the story quite a bit though. I try to do all the content in the game I can, but I do stay away from savages because I just don't have the time nor patience to really do it. But let's stop rambling about that. I have some thoughts about the newest expansion and mostly I want to touch on the story a bit and other things. I want to start with what I really enjoyed about this expansion and then afterwards I want to talk about the faults that really hold everything back in this expansion. So with that, let's just get to it, but I will, will be warning you, there are going to be spoilers for the story. So if you want to play it blind, I recommend to, well, just not watch this video. But until then, let's continue, and this is, well, my thoughts about Dawn Trail. Dawn Trail kicks off with us heading to what we call the New World, with a new character named Huak Lamont. We're hired by her to basically be companions in her venture to help her become the next Dawn Servant in the Rai Succession. But to do that, we have to traverse there by boat. While we're traversing by boat, of course, we're hit by a giant storm that we are all facing together, and, well, things have happened. But after the storm, a new day dawns, and there we see it. Turliolul, the city of the New World, Huak Lamont's home. And it's from here when the game actually, well, begins. It starts all the world building and everything, I gotta tell you. I love it when a game does really good world building, and I love learning about new cultures and races and everything, and for the most part, this expansion does do it quite well. Each race gets about an hour, hour and a half quest, so you have to learn about them. And honestly, it is very important to actually learn about them for what the Rise Succession actually means. For it wants the leaders to actually learn about its people that it is governing over. It wants the people to understand understand the people, not just rule over them, but understand and to, well, reason with them. And that's why the Rise Succession in this expansion is one of my more favorite ideas that I tried to pull off for, well, it's Galu Jaja's way of having his successors go out into the world and, well, get familiar with everything. But enough about the before, let's actually jump forward a bit. Things do go for the worst. Basically, we go from a nice, rural, like, you know, cultural Final Fantasy to a hyper-futuristic fantasy star Final Fantasy. And honestly, I love the aesthetics of Alexandria, the Alexandrians. I love the purple, I love the technology, I love the music there. I also love the story behind the Alexandrians and what happened to them in the past. And then the regulators and the cost it takes to use them, honestly. Then there are the special ones, the endless, the spirits who are technically dead, but are being kept alive by memory and aether alone, because, well, Queen Sphine has a problem of letting her subjects die. And so, these are some of the high points of the story for me. I know I'm quite vague, but I'm doing my best not to spoil it. But now there's, I'm going to look at other parts that I'm actually I quite like in the game in this expansion. For one, there's the music. So many areas in the game have excellent music. Toriolo, night and day, that amazing jazz at night, that really good theme during the day. Then, of course, you have Solution 9, that theme you hear in the background right now. Oof, it's a beautiful lo-fi beat. And then there are the dungeons. Honestly, not gonna lie, these are some of the best dungeons in Final Fantasy I've played in a long time. First dungeon you come across is Aihi Katamu. Uh, it starts, honestly, really good. You're on a boat and you're following Baku Jaja as he is sailing away from you, then sabotages you, and you have to circulate around, find your, a different way to get to where you have to go, and honestly, it is a pretty good starter dungeon for the expansion. And on top of that, the mechanics for the boss were actually quite interesting. They weren't new, but it refreshed you with some ideas and mixed things up just a tad bit. Then there's a second dungeon, Warcor Zormor, where you're climbing a mountain to find the Yakoi, who you need to talk to the due to the right of succession. And the dungeon, you're just going straight up the mountain. For me, this was my least favorite dungeon in the expansion, but it was still honestly quite good. Then the third dungeon is the Sky Deep Senna, which has a very dark and sad history that is tied to it. And when you get there, it does touch you a little bit for the sacrifices that have gone on here. 
And I think I, that's why I like this dungeon more than the second one, is the story reasons, personally. Then the fourth dungeon, which honestly is really high on my tier list, is Vanguard. You're crashing through a wall, basically you're infiltrating a place that is alien to you. The beat, the music, it just matches the dungeon perfectly and then the boss it has a very interesting mechanic where he will slither back and forth with his swords and you have to watch and make sure you dodge the right side or the left side for he moves his that hit that attack back and forth and you have to pay attention that man this dungeon is for me real high. Then afterwards, you have Orgenix, the facility that extracts the soul from a body and then removes the memories from that soul. Honestly, the dungeon is just really, really good. Then the boss afterwards is, oh, it makes us a few different things. So telekinesis is one. But yeah, if you fought a few bosses, you'll know this one, but then there's a few different things it does. I quite like it. And once again, the music in this dungeon was really good, personally. Then there's the last dungeon of the MSQ, Alexandria. For me, this dungeon was very bittersweet for what was happening while you're in it. Uh, to keep it, you know, unspoilery as possible, they're forgetting. As you go, Alexandria falls apart bit by bit until it's unrecognizable. Honestly, this dungeon was... It did what it had to do to really get in the mood for what was up coming honestly this dungeon for me i like it for multiple reasons the important one is i thought it was a really good dungeon in the game it fit the msq and for finishing the story i thought this dungeon did a pretty good job then after msq there are two other dungeons you can unlock one's tender valley it's basically a valley of cactars and oh boy i was taught a hard lesson that first boss actually killed me multiple times i had no idea what the mechanics were and the last boss is a good old shadow bringers call out eh, i thought it was cute and then the other dungeon you unlock is the strayboro deadwalk which i absolutely love this dungeon and everything that's in it the music is the Jesters of the Moon theme, and the boss is a Hades callback with a little difference, but I hate this dungeon for one simple fact. It should have called itself the Slay Burrow Deadlock. That's the one gripe I have with it. After dungeons, uh, something else I really like are the trials the game has. The first one is Valley Gamanda, who you get with the Yakoi, things happen, and honestly the fight is really really good. He uses the three elements to his advantage. Fire, ice, and thunder. He changes the arena that you're in depending on the element he's using, and also all his moves will change depending on what element he is. If he's using ice, there's gonna be an avalanche, fire, just everything burns, and thunder, you better stand in the right place or you are done. Really good beginning trial for the expansion. Then after that, the level 99 trial is Everkeep. You're going against Sorosia, all powered up with souls, and I am not lying when I say this is the hardest base trial in the expansion. The dimension bending he does and everything is amazing, but my favorite thing about this fight is the imagery that is happening. Zorolja cares so much about power, he throws away his humanity and throws away everything that keeps him tied to the earth. You see him strike down his father, his siblings, even his own flesh and blood, just to get power. And then when you, you see him at his full, like he's all powered up, you, ha you see the head of resolve. It is Zorolja, but there is no head of reason. And I found that really good imagery. Also, yeah, the fight is hard as balls. But then the last trial is the end of the MSQ, the Interfos. It is a being that is trying to do interdimensional travel to basically suck the Aether out other shards to keep life going with the Endless. And honestly, the fight has some pretty neat mechanics. The way, it, like, it does a weird, like, aether suck and the ground changes. It's like, oh man, it looks really cool. The fight itself actually is a little difficult. It's not as hard as Zorolja, but the fight does have a difficulty spike to it. Then the very last piece of content that I've done is the Arcadion, the raid. You have four battles in the AAC Light Heavyweight to become the champion of the division. And with this comes a story and four battles. And honestly, I'm telling you now, the story for this raid 
is actually quite good. Like, it is better, almost better immediately than the MSQ, which I'll get the more right after this. So, let me tell you about the four battles now. First battle, the AAC-1 is Black Cat, who becomes your buddy right afterwards. Her fight is very interesting. She's fast, she hits hard, she breaks the ground you stand upon, and a very interesting mechanic she has is she will grab an ally, or you, and she will smash you on the ground. What you want to do is you want to aim the attack on a towel that is yet to be broken, or you will just fall through the ground and die, and it is a very good intro battle, and on top of that, she becomes your buddy right afterwards. Then the AAC2, which is against Honey, be lovely. She's a country gal who uh, has the bee spirit of a bee who uses pheromones to control you. And honestly, I died the most during this battle than any other because her mechanics are very interesting. You have a heart above your head. She will do certain attacks that will basically increase your heart gauge. And if it fills up, you get stunned, stand in place, take hits to the face, and die. Her theme, I have a feeling, will get very annoying though after a set period of time if you try and do this on Savage. So I recommend turning the music down for that one if you do but her battle for me this one uh very difficult very good though then the aa3 of course every wrestling federation needs its own heel that is the brute bomber it is a guy who is fused with the beast spear of a bomb you can take a guess there's a lot of fire and a lot of wrestling moves, like lariats and everything else. It's an interesting battle, definitely not the hardest, but the guy hits hard, so if you get hit, uh, you be careful. But for the most part, uh, it's a straightforward battle. Not much is, you know, different in this one to worry about. His theme, though, is pretty darn good. But there is a fourth one to get to now. Then tier four is Wicked Thunder. She's fused with the Beast Spear of Ixion, and she uses Thunder and Electrope to her advantage. She will basically destroy the arena, she will make different clones of herself to attack at different locations, she will also summon a giant gun and just completely annihilate you and everything else. And she is also tied to the story of the raid. Her theme, I have to say, is also pretty darn good. Her battle's really good. But yeah, everything around this raid is really, really good. I like what's happening so far in these first four battles and the story itself, and I'm actually very interested in seeing what happens later. Well, for the most part, I've touched everything I think is actually really good about the expansion. But sadly, this is not... <laughs> Oh, how do I put this? It is not the best expansion in the entire game. For one, some things just don't look as good as they should, even though it just had a graphical update. I know some things just still look murky or not that great. And then, even though I absolutely praise the songs and the music, in this expansion, there are some really bad songs or uninteresting ones in this expansion. My least favorite is honestly the one that plays when you're making a train that is a literal bomb to ram a wall. That just comes out of nowhere and it's really weird. And then the song, I think it's the same song that plays when you beat the game. I absolutely hate that song. There's just areas that just have very uninteresting music, which is a shame because, my god, if you go back to, like, Shadowbringer, there are some amazing environmental songs in that game. This, these are just bland. Like, they're not even inspired by anything for me. And then another thing is, the story is a big issue. And I wish it wasn't, because the story got in its own way. It took forever for anything to happen. I get the beginning of the expansion, it wanted to take it nice and slow, show you the races, and have you learn about them, but this expansion took it way too slow. You want to know how slow, by the way? From when you step off that boat and until a Dawn Servant is crowned, the game is a slog. It starts great. The world building, the races, you're learning bits and pieces about each one. For 22 hours, you're doing this. And I love world building as much as the next person in story, but 22 hours of dragging your feet on the ground to crown a dawn servant doing these little tasks that are fine if they actually do this correctly. Though I, I still enjoy the story, but my god they had to pick up that pace. And that leads me to another issue, and it actually has to do with the main story. It's my least favorite part 
It's the Deus Ex earring Kryle has. I wish I was joking when I said it's my least favorite part, but I'm not. Listen, this is where spoilers are coming in. At the end, Sveen takes the only key that leads to the Golden City where she resides. Guess what? The earring Kryle just magically halves that I literally said at the beginning of the game, oh, I got a feeling that's gonna come important later, and I got a feeling I'm not gonna like it. Guess what? That is a key to the Golden City, the only one she took, by the way, that Sveen took at the end of the game, Kryle just apparently has an earring. And we use that, and that's how I reach the end of the game, everybody. I know they explain it with her parents and everything, but I swear to God, I hate that plot point so much. I honestly really, really hate the earring. It was so stupid to me. I know they explain it with her parents and that, oh man, we left that just so one day our daughter could find us one more time. I hate that earring. I hate that's the plot point we needed to get to the story. Well, enough about the plot. Time for another big issue with expansion, that is the voices, the voice acting in general. There are some people who have... You can tell their microphone quality is a lot different from other people's. If you listen to Graha Tia and Yastrola when they show up, Graha is clearly using the same mic as everyone else, but if you listen, I even oddly pointed this out while I was playing the game. I'm like, man, Yastrola sounds a lot different. She's clearly not using a different mic or something. And that is a small one. Yastrola barely appears. There's a... I'll get that in a second. But yeah, she's clearly using a different mic than everyone else, and you can clearly tell and it's very distracting. But... All keeping on the topic of her, what was the point of bringing all the Scions into this story? And I, I mean that. I really, really do. Listen, I love each and every one of these characters, but why was Astinian there? He didn't need to be there. He showed up twice. He was just, you know, three times. My bad. Yastrola, why was she there? She didn't need to be there. She was, like, there for two seconds. Graha was in there way more than her. He was actually in the story. Yastrola was there for two seconds. Alizé feels like she doesn't really do anything. Alpha Node's there. I feel like they put them in here because of the trust system or something, but you don't have to include all the Scions in an expansion. Give them time. Bring them when they actually feel useful, okay? You don't have to keep bringing them in just because. The big thing for me is the main character of this expansion because you're not the main character. You're more of a side character, which is fine. You don't always have to be the main, you know, focus. But the main character's expansion, you think they would have focused more things on. Like a better voice actor. Wakalamut's voice is either a hit, which there are points where her voice is fine. Sometimes when she does an emotion of like sadness or something, you kind of feel it. When she's normal, it's fine. But there's a lot of times she is a miss. A lot of times when she's supposed to be mad, she doesn't pull it off. And then if you really want one, the end of the game when she is screaming at Sveen, it is horrible. Like, I get that maybe they didn't have enough for people at the time or something, but the voice actor for Waklama was a very, very bad choice. It didn't drive me nuts up the wall, but then again, I watch anime in English dub, and I love PS2 games and PS1 voice acting, and even I know this was not good. It, her voice, it, it missed more than it hit, which is a problem for your main character of an expansion, and that's the problem. She is the main character, and her voice just does not fit at all. She is not good. <sighs> well, I think that's everything. And those are my thoughts about the expansion, honestly. I came back after skipping the expansion. I came back to this, and this is probably the worst expansion that FF14 has had, saying it's not unplayable or absolutely horrible or anything like that. Just past expansions are just way better than this. I love, like, I love Stormblood. Stormblood's really high up there for me. I hate Lise, annoying character. I like Wuklamont more than Lise, but her voice actor's horrible. And if you're wondering, hey, should I buy FF14 and play this expansion? Or, hey, I haven't played it in a while, should I play this expansion? If you love world building, and you like taking a story slow and experiencing things, and then, you know, a really good end game so far, sure. Just know that, hey, if you want to play the game in Japanese or a different language, it won't be much of a problem for you, but they take it too slow. But if that's not a problem and all that, I guess. The dungeons, like I said, these dungeons are extremely good. The trials are really entertaining. The end raid is pretty darn good. The problem is you have 22 hours of really 
slow stuff going on. Really, really slow stuff. I, I guess you can skip it, but that's up to you. But these are my couple thoughts about FF14's new expansion, Dawn Trail. And honestly, I've been thinking these for a while, and I felt like just putting this out there. And I really do hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you next time. I do hope you enjoyed this, and goodbye.